I can hear you. Fabulous. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to come meet us today. Um, I'm going to start off today's series of events with a prayer. Oh, what do we have? You have oh. endowed human beings with the ability to search out your laws by careful study of your creation. We ask your blessing on all engaged in scientific research and technology and on those who provide the resources for such work. May all of us choose to devote ourselves to projects which both enhance human life and have regard to the safety and well-being of the world you created. Through these choices, may we be true stewards of all that you have given us and for the service of others and for your greater glory. Amen. <laughs> by our Kumu Wood. Where is it? Oh, right here. Uh, as we do at Chama University, we're all starting with Ule for prayer. Um, and like we do in Hawaii, also like welcome all of you. Uh, so I'll be doing an Ole uh, created by Kaipo Leopoldino, a previous alumni of Chama University. Uh, and it's meant to be more of a, an Ole Aloha or a chant for, for welcoming uh, and I thought it would be appropriate to do this for this conference today. So, ai ai ke kula o kalai ko hakuni ka o me o na kua i na i na i e li na ke aloha ya ka ko e ki pa mai aloha i aloha i aloha i. And with that, we welcome all of you. And I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Kiffin. All right, thank you so much. All right. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, we are here today to talk about the xenotransplantation efforts by Dr. Griffith and his team. And uh, we're going to start the Q&A session by talking to the patient's son, uh, David Bennett Jr. So aloha, David, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you being here. I'm grateful for your appearance tonight, and I want to lead off with my deepest condolences for the loss of your father, um, on behalf of both myself and the entire Shamanad Ohana. Thank you. Yeah. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge two of our audience members today, um, your wife, Christy Bennett, and my sister, Ruby Tuesday. Without their friendship, none of this would have been possible. We would not all be here to gather today. So on behalf of the widespread audience, thank you ladies, I appreciate it. And thank you for attending, and I'm certain you two will have a lot of fun commenting in the peanut gallery, typing lots of private chats to each other. Um, just make sure they're private chats, okay? <laughs> just kidding. Um, anyway, David, thank you very much also for inviting Drs. Griffiths and Grazioli, um, a gesture which ramped up what I thought would be a much smaller private Q&A session um, into a, a larger guest lecture seminar with a much larger, wider audience, and I greatly appreciate it, as I'm sure does Shamanad's media department. Um, so you and I are going to start off with the questions today, and I, I'd like to start with the questions by asking you a little bit about your father, maybe a little bit of commemorative sentences. Um, from what I've gleaned, he seems to be a very resilient, charming, and funny man. Um, I was particularly struck by the comments of the question, will I oink? Um, clearly, he was a very funny and charming man, a lot of comedic relief. So could you take a couple minutes to describe him and maybe share a couple of memories of him for us? Absolutely. Um... First of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a, it's an honor and privilege uh, to um, do this um, for my dad, um, who gave his life uh, to help advance science. Uh, my dad, as I knew him, was rather goofy. Uh, I, I thought the well, I only was pretty clever myself. Um, but yeah, he he, I knew him as somebody that was rather goofy. He for me as his son, he was always generous with his time, uh, making himself available whenever I was in town, visiting with grandchildren, et cetera. Um, I, I think probably one of my uh, favorite descriptions to date has been by Dr. Griffith actually, uh, who described my dad as a rascal. <laughs> I don't think there's a, a more accurate way to describe him sometimes. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, a bit of a rascal, a bit of a goofy guy, uh, but uh, able to have conversations and make whoever he was 
around feel comfortable and welcome and whatever they were doing. Um, for me as a son, my dad always reminded me of how proud he was of me. Um, he would leave simple messages on my phone, voicemails, uh, especially in the last couple years. Um, you know, I think he understood that he was struggling uh, a bit in the last year. Um, and when he would send me a message, I would kind of reply back, is everything okay? I love you, dad, good to hear from you. And sometimes it was crickets. Sometimes there was no response. Um, but regardless, I appreciated him reaching out. And uh, that is a, a tender mercy uh, for me as a son, just knowing that he was proud of me and that he loved me and um, my dad was such uh, that he kind of kept, kept um, things a little private. Um, recently have a group of friends that uh, have gotten into this kind of fantasy way of describing uh, their emotional state by using this characteristic or this uh, description of emotional kingdoms. And I think about my dad and what his uh, kingdom would look like per se. Uh, my dad was somebody that, similar to me, that just had lots of friends, lots of acquaintances, just got along with people very well. And I think for him, he would have like the shack up in the woods and there would be this huge courtyard and he would just go down there and spend majority of his day just socializing with people. My dad was a very social person. And I remember as a teenager, like my dad was cool uh, and I used to spend a lot of time with him. So those are some of the memories that I have. Yeah, so um, I'll try to make this rather concise because as you can imagine, this this was a pretty lengthy process. Um, so it just so happens that I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Uh, so I have some idea of what my dad was suffering with when he first was admitted to the hospital. And he had severe heart failure with an ejection fraction of like 30%. So his heart wasn't functioning very well. Uh, and it was down to 10% at one point. Uh, or probably a lot of points, but so he we went into the hospital and he had, uh, he was very, very bad off. And frankly, I didn't think he was gonna live a week in the state that he was in. This was even before he got to the University of Maryland. So he was uh, transferred from a local hospital in Hagerstown to the University of Maryland per his request actually. Um, about a decade ago, he had a mitral valve replacement and Dr. Griffith can correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. Um, but he had, a, he had a pig valve replacement about a decade earlier, and that was done at the University of Maryland. So he had nothing but great things to say about the University of Maryland and wanted to go back there, even over for John Hopkins University, which is pretty renowned as well. Um, but to answer your question, um, so I knew he was bad off and they had tried just about everything to save my dad's life. And all the therapies were failing uh, to give him to, to allow his heart to return to, to what it was. Um, and Dr. Griffith can go into the details. I won't bore you guys, um, but this was, this was a last ditch effort. Um, and my dad, being that he was hospitalized for several months before this discussion even came about, um, I knew that he had some delirium and delusion that set in. I remember the week of the conversation that my aunt had visited him and he was talking like he had, he was hearing voices and just some odd things. So when he, my dad was the first one that told me about this. He said, um, they're talking about doing a pig's heart. And I was kind of caught off guard and didn't really believe him. Um, but then it was either, I think it was the next day that Dr. Rivers called me. And uh, I can't say enough good things. about Dr. Griffith and his ability to, um, to just spend time. I mean, a doctor's time is very valuable and he doesn't have much of it, but Dr. Griffith spent, I, I guarantee, an hour with me. 
that first conversation and that made the world a difference but it made me trust dr griffith a, a, a lot um, and he just talked to me about what we were facing and the reality of it and you know basically he saw my dad as a patient and this was it, my dad had a fight i, I don't think i've ever seen somebody that's wanted to live more than my dad um and so that that stuck out to dr griffith and that's one of the reasons that he even considered this um, operation and so i remember that and basically the reason dr griffith called me is because in any type of um, experimental surgery they need to have the family on board i mean i could imagine anybody could probably imagine the catastrophe you would have if uh the family wasn't on board and this was you know it didn't go as planned and all that kind of stuff so it was clear that that was one of the reasons that they called me the other reason is because my dad um wanted to appoint me as his medical proxy and so i would be making some very important decisions um fast forward a couple days my dad was talking to me about this and my dad was pretty set on getting a human heart transplant but he simply wasn't a candidate um so we continue to have conversations and you know i i tried not because it's my dad's life it's my dad's decision i simply presented the facts of what i knew about the odds about where his current state was my dad wanted nothing more than to go home like any patient in the hospital for several months um, he wanted nothing more than to go home and he didn't care how he accomplished that and he was just in a, such a bad shape he would not have made it out of the hospital and um i know at one point he asked me what i should what he should do um and so i just i just told him you know uh basically your odds of living are is small um your odds of this being successful are also small um but it's it's a it's a yeah it's kind of a a rough situation right um anyway so i i just was frank with them and basically i have a voicemail that i'll never delete off my phone where I think my dad was using me as a soundboard. Um, and he just was basically telling me that he was doing this. He was doing this and nobody was gonna convince him otherwise and don't stand in his way. And that he was going forward with this pig transplant, the porcine xeno transplantation for the, the science nerds out there. Um, and that he was doing this and don't stand in his way. And it was, it was confirming, you know, my dad was very with it. He had moments where he would be extremely with it and then times where he wasn't with it. And as a son and family, we very much knew that. I mean, I'm sure anybody can work together the sort of emotions that you have in that type of moment to where a family member is on their deathbed and they're given impossible odds. The, all you can do is pray hope for a miracle and trust in the doctors. And my dad trusted the doctors. And that's what he did is he moved forward with that trust and the, the, and the when he appointed me as his medical proxy, he said a couple of things. One is that he said, don't kill me. Um, and the second thing is um, when I was asking specifics about, um, what's the word, I'm drawing a blank, basically his decisions to move forward um, power of attorney, medical proxy, I don't remember exactly the word, but um, he, he made it clear basically some of his expectations, but ultimately it just came down to the, whatever the doctors say, that's what you should do. And so that's what I, I was my dad's big, biggest advocate. And each one of these doctors can speak to how much of a hard time I gave them, how many questions I asked them, how many questions my aunt asked them, my sister, you know, any type some we felt like something wasn't quite in line. The University of Maryland, I cannot say enough good things about them and how they treated my dad and how they treated my family. Uh, communication was a, a huge factor, especially in something like this. And anyway, uh, hopefully that sheds some a little light, little light on the question that you asked. I know it was kind of a complicated question, so I appreciate your ability to answer it. Um, so I followed your social media quite vicariously post your father's operation. And by proxy, so have my students, if not by their own free will. Um, and it seemed quite emotional and very publicly emotional, lots of ups and downs on a public front. Now, some days you were sure you would recover, and then others, around that 40 day post op mark, started to build repair requests, and his organs began to fail, and it was a very public demise. Um, 
So I know Dr. Grazioli will fill us in with all the technical details, but can you broadly comment on his post-operative conditions and how your family dealt with the emotional roller coaster in the public eye that I followed on social media? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of what I shared was from the nurses. I called every day to check on my dad. Um, I knew when he was having surgery, I would get calls at work uh, giving consent to certain up procedures. It was, it was not easy, but I felt like the reason I started doing that social media is because I had the thought after they first did the surgery, I was with my dad those, those um, first few days and I was getting a, a, an influx of requests. I was living like basically a double life. Like I had my family life and my work, and then I was getting all these requests during my lunch break. I was speaking with the media when I was at the hospital and my, my dad was in surgery, I was speaking with the media. Um, and the reason I did that. Oh, was for my dad. I sacrificed my time with my family, my time to just relax because I knew my dad and the type of person that he was and how much he gave. Uh, he, he helped elderly people when they needed help. He, he, I'm sure he said no at times, but he was a yes man in a lot of ways. And um, when he decided to do this and we had a really tough discussion, my dad hasn't spoken with me seriously about a lot of things in life, but one thing he has is if I die, this, these are the things I want you to do, you know? And one of the things he said is, I want to help however I can, whether that's donating organs or helping advance science. Um, and Dr. Griffith can talk about it a little bit more, but um, that was something he wanted to do. And so when my dad didn't have the capability to do it himself, I knew that I was his proxy and I was the person that could stand for him and speak. Uh, to the media and others. And um, so as I started to do that early on, I thought to myself, man, I'm sharing this information, this news internationally. The people that deserve to know this most are the people I love and care about. My family, my friends, and the people that know me best. So I began to share very personal information. I began to share those daily updates. And that was time consuming. My wife can attest to that. Sure. Um, I, I was sharing that with my family and friends because I felt like it was important because they're important to me. Family's important uh, more than anything else. And uh, it was a roller coaster. Um, like you said, I mean, it was a success early on. I, I, like I, I, don't, I don't remember a lot now, but everything that Dr. Griffith told me, everything that Dr. Grazioli told me, I remember. Uh, I feel like that was inspired and I was given the ability to remember, to be able to communicate with others and help them learn along the, along the way and share how remarkable and groundbreaking and how much of a miracle this operation truly was. First of all, because it, it was a success. Um, and then, you know, he was out of a 10 day, I think it was a rejection period. Uh, and then they continued to talk about rejection and infection and the balance. Um, and so my dad was doing real well. Um, but all that he was still extremely deconditioned and i didn't want to i didn't want to create this false picture that everything was roses because i mean when i'm saying my dad's doing good that means he has some head control i mean he doesn't really have control of his extremities um and so i was trying to be totally transparent with people and share really how my dad was doing but yeah like you said the last, the last few weeks of his life, he, he started suffering a great deal. And that was very difficult to see those infections set in, uh, you know, him getting out of bed and watching the Super Bowl and, and like them having conversations about him getting out of the room. That was very lifting. I mean, I wanted nothing more than my dad to get out of the hospital. He wanted nothing more than everybody was rooting for my dad. Everybody was praying for my dad. I was receiving so much support. I can't even say thank you or express the gratitude I have for all the individuals that reached out. But it was an emotional roller coaster. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy um, because it, it was not easy. But um, it's, it's incredible the, um, the strength we have at times uh, like that.
Um, and, and everybody's trial is a bit different. Um, that was certainly one for me and my family. And the amount of strength that we were given during that time um, was nothing short of a miracle. Well, that leads right into my next question of the public eye constantly. So I'm sure that you understood at the time that the operation was groundbreaking as the world's first porcine to human xenotransplant. But were you prepared and how did you become prepared for the international attention it's garnished upon your family? It's quite a lot of international fame and hullabaloo. hullabaloo. Um, and it's probably mixed and sometimes tiresome blessing. Um, can you comment on how your dad seemed to feel about it? And as a follow-up, how have you and your family on a personal level handled the overnight bump into the international spotlight, especially having small children of your own? Yeah, so that was one of the things I was most nervous about early on. <laughs> um, as any of those doctors could have told you, um, my dad was relatively private. He would keep, my dad's always been kind of, let's keep it more like superficial. Um, so um, for me, um, having my dad's permission and his, him being able to clearly communicate how important this was, not only for him, but for others, was um, an obvious is, go away, go away. Is, I want to share. I want to share this with others. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback right now. Um, so that that was a uh, was a go ahead for me. I know on several occasions that my aunt shared with my dad, like he had some of the newspaper articles in, in his office or uh, in his uh, room, um, and that was uh, um, like. He was, he was proud of that. I mean, he was obviously in pretty bad shape, um, but he was happy to hear that this was being shared and that this wasn't being done for nothing. He wasn't suffering for nothing, you know, uh, despite maybe some self-interest there too. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't really prepare yourself for the media <laughs> uh, as much as you might try. Um, initially, the University of Maryland, I mean, they, are well connected to some major networks like the New York Times, I believe, and the uh, Wall Street Journal. And there's just a couple like pretty uh, renowned networks uh, nationally that they were connected to. So they were extremely helpful. Uh, Deborah Coates and Bill, Bill Seiler uh, have been an asset to me and my family. Um, and I can't say enough good about them. Um, so they helped channel some things early on and that certainly helped me as a family or us as a family be able to navigate that. But even regardless, regard, regardless of that and the protection that they kind of the buffer that they were, I mean, these the media is relentless. Uh, they're reaching out through Facebook. They somehow find your, you know, your cell phone number. Uh, it's incredible. So I was getting requests nonstop. And, you know, I didn't really say no to a lot of people. There was, I think there was one media network from Brazil that I said no to just because they were a bit over the top. Um, but yeah, I was getting requests from all over Europe. I spoke, spoke with an Austra uh, Australian uh, radio company, um, Japan. I mean, it was all, all hours of the day uh, that I was getting requests. Um, and so it's not easy, um, but I knew, I knew it was necessary to spread this. Like I was extremely appreciative of the University of Maryland and all that they were willing to do to help my dad. And I wanted to I knew I could never pay them back for what they did. And this was my way of showing them my appreciation for what they were doing for my dad. Um, my wife commented that she didn't think much of it initially. And I don't think University of Maryland even fully understood what would come their way. But uh, my wife thought it would be something where doctors may be interested. She didn't think that there was going to be this international interest. Uh, but people love news and this is like a medical breakthrough. so. Why wouldn't people be interested in? It's surprising how many uh, cards and letters and, and prayers that we got from just the most random of people that found individuals in their family in similar situations. I can't begin to tell you how many stories I've heard. Uh, and that was um, a very, like sweet moments for me, sweet moments for my family. Um, the hardest thing for me was not living the double life, being able to communicate what I was going through with family. Because when you talk to so many people, 
at, at one at some point you just feel like you're repeating yourself over and over again and you don't know who you have and who you haven't talked to and so that was difficult to navigate but um hopefully that paints a picture of what that was what that was like. <laughs> a little overwhelming to say it sounds very complicated and very overwhelming so that's the end of uh, my series of questions so thank you very much for your thoughtful responses um the next series of this platform is going to be uh, dr claire wright who's going to be interviewing dr carly griffith um, and i am going to share my screen here so that i can give dr claire i'm sorry dr wright's introduction Good evening, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I introduce one of our speakers today, who will be interviewing Dr. Bartley Griffith on his recent successful xenotransplantation of a genetically modified pig heart into a patient. This is a novel and very exciting improvement in medicine in which we should all be deeply interested. Only about 10% of heart transplant candidates actually receive a transplant because of course, there are not a lot of human hearts to go around. However, this medical advancement has the potential to raise that percentage of people who actually receive a heart transplant, which of course will save lives. We couldn't have asked for a better interviewer on this topic. She holds a bachelor's in physiology, a master's in neuroscience, and a PhD in neuropathology. All of these fields are extremely important to consider when discussing heart transplants. She has 20 years of experience within the realm of, phys of physiology, neuroscience, and human anatomy. In this time frame, she has worked in the fields mentioned as a research assistant, postdoctorate, junior research assistant, assistant professor, and senior director. She has done this work in the United Kingdom as well as here in Hawaii working for the Shamnag University, John A. Burns School of Medicine, the University of Hawaii, and various schools in the UK. She has 24 peer-reviewed publications and has spoken at numerous conferences in fields relating to physiology, development, and neuroscience. Now, if everyone would please join me in welcoming Dr. Claire Kendall Wright. Welcome, thank you for inviting us. Hello, Dr. Griffith. Um, I'm Dr. Claire Campbell Wright, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank Joseph and Eva for introducing us. It's always great to get the students involved. I also wanted to thank Dr. Griffith. So that's the Griffith with an S, and you're Dr. Griffith, so we're trying not to get too confused by, by that small S. Um, but she has really put in a lot of time and energy to put this consortium together today to give us, our students and the wider community, this opportunity to really learn from everyone. I also wanted to take a moment and recognize David. Thank you so much for being so candid with us, for telling us your story, for talking about your father and, and, and reliving some of those very emotional experiences. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that because at Acanthic Mariner School, we really try to take the approach of, of a holistic approach, really understanding the full person. And so it's so important for our students that are on the, on the Zoom today to really understand that this is a wonderful opportunity for scientific learning, but also we're talking about an individual. This is a human person who is alive and meant so much to his family and friends. 
and now leaves us this wonderful legacy with Dr. Griffith and his team of moving science forward within this realm of science. So thank you everybody for joining us today. So we have a series of questions um, that have come in ahead of time and I'd like to kind of kick it off with you if that's all right, Dr. Griffith, and um, ask you about a little bit more about David Bennett himself. Um, what made him such an optical, oh, sorry, an optimal candidate for this novel procedure? And if, if it's okay with you, uh, David Jr., can we have a brief medical kind of overview on why he was chosen as the recipient for this and what medically really made him such a great fit? Yeah, well, again, I, I wish to acknowledge um, my partner in this, a uh, key partner who's the scientific uh, director of our xenotransplant program, Dr. Mohedin, uh, with whom I've been working for five years to translate his previous 15 years of work into a clinical moment, which uh, we're here in some sense celebrating, but learning about and, uh, and doing exactly what, uh, what uh, Dave Bennett had requested of us, which is to learn something and to uh, spread that learning to those who are most interested. We also have here a Sahara Kapil, who is now the world's expert in xeno heart, tra uh, heart transplantation for infectious diseases, and Alison Grazioli, who basically uh, was at uh, Dave's bedside uh, pretty much all the time for 60 days, and even for the many weeks that he was in our ICU waiting for a decision and then for the procedure to occur. So leaving that behind, why was he such an ideal candidate? He was a terrible candidate. And you know, I mean that in, in the truest sense of the word. He's right. um, he he would, um, would be classified as almost untreatable by transplantation standards. He hadn't been out of bed for over 60 days. Um, he was becoming thin. His muscles were, were you know, wasting away. Um, he had um, a bone marrow trouble. He had trouble making white, white blood cells in his, uh, in his body and responded poorly to a number of antibiotics that he required pre-transplant because of infections. Those antibiotics caused his white blood cell, we use the word crash, you know, to drop down rather suddenly. And that exposes him for infection, but also was a little bit of a forewarning to us that uh, if we get pretty sophisticated drugs on board that we know suppress the immune system and also the, the bone marrow, that he might not have enough self-infection fighting, you know, to withstand the onslaught, expected onslaught of bacteria and viruses. Um, but, you, you know, we, we were at equipose in the laboratory setting that we weren't gonna learn any more from the multiple and very expensive um, animal trials. These, uh, these experimentations uh, that preceded uh, David's procedure were performed with the same hearts, the uh, selection of, of hearts that David received, but they were placed in non-human primates, uh, baboons that weighed about 60 pounds at the most, sometimes 40 pounds. Um, these small animals uh, were treated, you know, as precious citizens in our laboratory and, and cared for well, but, but we could only answer so many questions. And uh, Dr. Mohideen and I had decided that with nine months survival and regular six months survival in those animals, that we had reached a point in the laboratory where very little else could be learned in a relatively short period of time. And if the optimal patient might come up, for a procedure of this nature, we might actually um, ask the FDA for permission um, to use this potentially very powerful and unique therapy to try to save the life and then to learn something. We knew that we were building towards a much bigger trial of xeno you know, heart transplantation um, based on our work and our interactions with the FDA, but we knew also that the FDA was going to require additional testing that would push us out more than two years. Uh, we felt that uh, if the right patient came along, we would have the chance of saving a life in that that patient had no other option and learn something that would make that bigger trial much more 
likely to be successful as we could tighten aspects of the protocol, which we, you know, couldn't do with absolutely no human experience. We used uh, medications on Dave that had never been used in a human before. So, you know, it's only so much that you can learn in the lab. So David, um, and when I say he was a terrible candidate, he was so sick, you know, he was on an artificial heart and lung machine for 40, 40 plus days, basically in bed, you know, on his back. Uh, his nutrition was not great. Um, and, and the only thing about Dave that made him a great candidate was his toughness, I think. It was the fact that he didn't want to die. Um, he was a candidate for this procedure because we had nothing else to give him. And we knew he wouldn't survive to walk out of the hospital. Um, and quite frankly, as we talked to the family and to David himself, we didn't know whether this pig heart would work for two minutes two days, two months, two years. We honestly didn't know because how can you know that, right? Um, the testing of this was just done, you know, in animals that have a different immune system. And they were as close to humans as we could get, but they were non-human primates, right? Um, so um, when we went into this, uh, we knew that maybe he was too sick to potentially benefit, even if things kind of went the right way. But who else would you offer such a procedure to? You know, and we, we struggled with this. And a lot of our peers, you know, when we present this case, a lot of the scientific response has been, oh my goodness, he was too sick, right? Well, I always come back and say, well, if not Dave, who, right? Now, maybe if there's a second patient that we're given permission based on what we've learned, uh, comes up, maybe that patient won't be quite as sick as David Bennett Sr., right? Maybe we can say, we now know that this heart is going to beat pretty strongly for 60 days or 40 days, and that our enemy isn't in that first 30 days as we thought it might be. And so we might be able to get a patient that maybe is even up and walking, but can't have a heart transplant for, you know, one of many, many reasons. Um, and so um, I guess, I guess, and, and Allison and Kapil can, can weigh in here, but I think that what endeared us to him was he didn't want to pass. He was tough as nails, right? His whole history was a, a tough guy. You know, he was a tough guy. Um, and we threw a lot at him that, that challenged him physically, and yet he was always there the next morning, you know, until the very end. And so, uh, some patients, when they get sick, they just, you know, they just seem, they just seem to pass away. You know, David fought for every breath, and uh, he did so with great valor and uh, our deep respect. So it's because of all that that uh, that we thought he was a good candidate. He did have a sense of humor, which, which let us off the hook a little bit. He knew he had us stressed. You know, he was stressed, but you know, you get a guy. My last preoperative discussion occurred the morning of January 7th as he was going into the operating room. And as I pushed him into the OR, I, I, I'll just ask you, what do you think he said? I mean, what would you say to somebody? You know, it's like, is this your, are these your last words or what, you know, what is it that you would say if you were going, you know, to have this procedure? Um, pray for me, doc. Um, which we did do, by the way, in the operating room. We had a common uh, quiet period for David before we started, but that's not what he wanted. He didn't want a prayer. Um, uh, you know, he, 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 um, he looked me straight in the eye and uh, we were all ready to go. And he, he said to me, he said, hey doc, are you sure I can't get a human heart? <laughs> you know, so he just, you know, he was, he was a rascal, you know, and he was, unrepressible, I would say, you know, and so we at least knew we, we had him emotionally where we wanted him, if not physically, right? Um, and so that was what, in my mind, sold the deal. We were putting this experimental heart into somebody with a terrible um, ability to fight infection, uh, who was on the south end of nutrition. Um, but, you know, and I, I see from the overall context, the spirituality of, of your university, uh, 
you, you know, the mind can be pretty powerful, you know, and uh, we've learned that in medicine. So that's a very long-winded answer to your very straightforward, simple question that you hope I answered in, in a minute. But there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, it's great to hear such a detailed answer like that, and it, and it really is uh, great to hear more about the individual and, and, and a little bit more about his history, because my next question really is kind of leading into, so given he had such, a, you know, he had a strong mind, he had a wonderful spirit by the sound of things, you know, he did have a lot of, of complications, other health issues. And so we were wondering, how did that direct your surgical approach? Were there things that you perhaps did differently in him than, than if it had been another candidate? Um, and how does that direct you? Could you speak a little bit more specifically about how that directs you moving forward? Because I saw today some really nice imagery of how the heart started off, you know, that, that rock star, I think, is, is what you called it in a different presentation, that rock star heart moving from looking so great to its edematous state to, you know, really the left and right ventricle looking, looking terrible. Um, yeah. So that was, that was fascinating from, from a, you know, scientific nerd point of view, great, we're all self-professed scientific nerds here. Um, and so can you speak a little bit more about how his pre-existing conditions directed your surgical approach? and then how that helps direct you in the future. You've spoken a little bit about that, but we'd be interested to hear some of those things. Well, actually, um, this procedure had been practiced for five years in, in the laboratory. And um, I've been doing heart transplantation since 1979. And so if you combine that, um, you know, there's not too much in the, in the terms of a, of a transplant that you can throw at me that I haven't seen. And so I think that helped me confidential wise. I mean, I was confident, not confident, but I was confident that we could pull this thing off in terms of the technical aspects. We had not practiced um, in animals who had heart failure though. And, and uh, Dave was a you know bigger man and he was thin, but he was you know a normal sized person, but in terms of height. Um, and we had used this, um, this pig that had been um, genetically modified to not grow quite as quickly as, as it would normally want to grow. So this pig was over a year old and weighed 125 kilograms. Well, at that time, uh, Dave was, uh, gosh, he was almost uh, 60 kilograms or maybe 65 kilograms in weight. And, and so, I was frankly worried that the heart would be too big and that we'd have trouble closing up Dave's chest after we were finished because that would be a rather embarrassing sight. Um, the heart's working great, it just doesn't fit in his chest. Um, but, and, and we've, we've, you know, we've actually practiced on big pigs, you know, and they have pretty big hearts. But the, the heart that came out of this, this animal um, was, uh, a good bit smaller than we anticipated. Not too small, but it uh, it made me think, I wonder if this is too small. Um, it wasn't shown to be just right, actually. But it was placed in Dave's chest, and Dave's chest didn't line up as, a, as an animal would have. Our experience, again, was in normal um, baboons, and uh, baboons aren't in heart failure, so they don't have misshapen hearts, you know, and they don't have um, dilations of what we would normally want to connect the new heart to. And so um, David's heart kind of blew up like a balloon, both in the lower pumping chambers, but most notably in the upper chambers. And um, uh, the left side of his heart connection, uh, that was the left atrial connection, which was so important, it took the blood from the lungs. Um, it was probably circumferentially uh, three times bigger, maybe four times bigger than the circumference of the pig atria. And we nipped and tucked and took little darts out of the circumference of the, um, of the host atria in order to fit the donor atria on board. Uh, we got that okay. But then what happened by doing so, uh, the whole thing shifted. <laughs> so that the middle of David's right side of connection now was way over to the right side of his chest whereas the pig heart it was 
it went along with the first stitching. You know, it, it was pushed way over to the left. So somehow we had to get those two new trains to meet, and that, that took a little bit of gasping. And, um, and um, let's say youthful enthusiasm and expectation on the surgeon to, to tell everybody to be calm, we'll make this fit. And uh, there were a lot of naysayers, I must say, but uh, we got it together. So uh, that was the biggest issue. And then, of course, uh, striking up the band, you know, giving blood back to that heart. When that heart, you know, kind of got natural blood from Dave, you know, and it, and it didn't turn dark, which is what happens when there's an initial rejection. There's a bad rejection and the arteries clot off. The heart turns purple like a grape and um, just doesn't beat. This heart, it was like pulling the cord on a, on a, uh, on a lawnmower. I mean, this heart just went boom. And uh, we had trouble holding it back, actually. Um, it definitely wanted wanted life in Dave. There's no question about it. And um, we were quite grateful. And uh, it was very soon that we took him off the sustaining heart lung machine. We were afraid that maybe that heart would suddenly have a rhythm problem or something. So we kept him on that machine uh, for a couple of days. Uh, but then it was just demanding to come off. So we, we weaned him from that major support and he was on his own, you know, for a very long time. Thanks for sharing that with us. You've been, you've been quoted as saying that the surgery seems squirrely um, and that there's some, <laughs> there's a little bit of kind of plastic surgery procedurally that has to happen in there. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, it was squirrely and then I, I tried to explain to you that the, the the size of, of the host connections was probably four times as big as the donors connections. And so you can make up distance, you know, just by smart stitching. Um, but we had to kind of move things around a little bit. We had to make, make incisions into Dave's heart or the, the, the non-pumping part of the heart, the upper chambers into which we were connected in a way that uh, we don't typically do, right? That took a little bit of, uh, um, I, I would say um, experiential luck, you know, and so the surgery was a little squirrely. I mean, people were squirming, you know, uh, who were assisting me because they, they were shaking their heads, you're not going to get this thing together. And that would have been terrible, right? I, uh, Dave Bennett Jr., Jr. Um, the surgery is completed, but we couldn't get the hearts to match, you know. Imagine that, right? The whole world was waiting to hear what happened and, um, and we couldn't put the hearts together. So. That was a little bit of a, uh, of a concern uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, but uh, you know, we, I knew we could get it together. So that's what the scroll was all about. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. So I have some questions now more about the pig part itself, um, because the pig itself, uh, you know, it's used for the transplant. Um, and so what I've read about it, the, the company itself genetically modified 10 PGs. And so some of the pig genes were modified and some were nullified and six human genes were inserted. And so when we're kind of thinking about what that meant in terms of modifications and tailoring to the pa patient and that that mostly was done to help with the immunorejection. Um, so how were these tailored, were they tailored specifically to the patient, some of these modifications? Or, if, you know, can you speak to more how that design came about? Super question. Um, Revivacor um, has for now 30 years been working to produce a uniform donor for everyone, right? So their approach to it has been not to try to create uh, a donor organ for Dr. Griffiths or, you know, a specific person. It is supposed to be an organ that's as good as any other transplant organ, i.e. Uh, from a random donor, if you wish, that's the same blood type as the recipient, and, uh, to which that recipient doesn't have preformed uh, likelihood of rejecting. And we measure that on every human heart transplant. And, you know, there's an occasional patient that we have a hard time matching for a donor, but it's not often. So the idea was just to replace human hearts with an on-demand pig organ that could be commercially raised. 
So if you, if you start from that perspective, you know that um, the major goal was just to get the nature of, of our antibodies and what our body normally wants to do to something as foreign as a pig in, implanted in our bloodstream. Now, most we know the humans are, are kind of piggish in many ways. You know, George Orwell told us all that. We just have to look around every day and know that. But 80 million years ago, we tried to separate. And, um, and so on the, you know, on the genetic switch overs, it was 80 million years ago that the pigs started doing their thing. And we ended up with a chain that brought us to humans. So, so that's a long time to have independent development and foreignness, you know, through mutations occurs. So the pig is very different. Uh, it's much different, you know, there was baby Faye who was operated upon uh, um, quite a while ago um, by, uh, by actually a dear friend of mine. And, and, and that, was, that was different because that was a non-human primate heart, you know, which is a lot closer and frankly, a lot easier to make match to the human than a pig. So this was a much bigger step, right, when we used a pig organ. And um, most people would be surprised to know that a pig has about 30,000 genes. And, um, you know, it's hard to believe that you could, in, that, in essence, fiddle with 10 of them, right, and make a difference that almost got David Benton Sr. out of the hospital, right, and would let that heart function away, you know, beating like a rock star, um, yeah, for a long, long time, and, and I'm not even convinced to this day that we ever really had rejection. We're still working on tissues to, to take a deep dive into what really happened, and we're uncertain to that. But this heart worked really well just with the change of 10 genes and supplemental drugs to combat, uh, uh, you know, rejection, which we use in humans as too, right? So, well, it's different in the Xeno work. We still give additional uh, drugs to our human patients. So these, these genes, um, there were basically uh, research had shown that there were three major genes uh, that produced carbohydrate residues on the surface of, of the pig blood vessels that we would recognize, you know, as an anaphylactic response. So like if you were allergic to bee stings and you got stung, it would be like that, right? So you would basically, your immunity would just totally freak out and your innate immunity would rush into the heart and cause it to clot off. That's what would happen. Um, so when those three sugar residues were identified as important vehicles for the recognition of acute rejection, and when the molecular science that permitted not only CRISPR, but this was before CRISPR science, to permit those particular genes to be knocked out. So they knocked them out using, you know, uh, embryos and whatever. Um, those, three, those three genes basically opened the door. And so the other genes that were added were to reduce the blood clotting because we, we learned that the pigs, while they have methods to control blood clotting, that would naturally happen as part of rejection. Um, uh, they don't have enough of it. They don't have enough. So we then, not we, but the, the team that preceded me, uh, designed better augmentation of anti-clotting at the local level in the heart and put genes in there to do that. And then finally, it was identified that there was a lot of inflammation with xenotransplantation within the heart. And so genes were put in to tap that down to mitigate inflammation. So altogether, it was a 10 gene change, right? Maybe we could have done just as well with three. We definitely needed those first three knockouts. Oh, and then we knocked out the growth hormone, the growth gene, not hormone, uh, that keep, kept these pigs about half the size that they normally would be. And that's important because we didn't want the heart to keep growing in, in David, right? David's chest is only so big, but that pig heart is designed to take care of a 400 pound animal. And there was some evidence uh, in some of the kidney work that the kidneys that got small kidneys from animals that didn't have growth hormone knockout, those kidneys kept growing and got quite large and over, overtook the whole abdomen of the, of the animal. So this was thought to be important.
So that's what I need to know. It, it costs about $750,000 to make one of those pigs. Now that's, that's you know, the designer one of knockoff where they're doing onesies. That wasn't using F1 and two generations, which ultimately the commercial business plan would do. You know, once you've got your clones, then the clones would have daughters and those daughters would have daughters. And, and you know, that would be an exponential increase in your herd size. And so you could have a, uh, a commercial enterprise. But right now it's, it's one animal at a time. So that's an expensive operation. And of course, it's very expensive to do non-human primate work. So it's about a million bucks of experimental procedure. Uh, good question, and uh, you have three experts here, and I'm, I'd like to ask the other two what they think. I'll give you my thought. But, yeah, please. Uh, how, about, how about Allison, our director of the CSICU, followed by uh, Kapil Sahari? Um, well, we um, administered uh, these antibodies, IVIG, for, for different reasons. Um, the first uh, time we administered them, and, and again, we didn't um, have knowledge. I'm not sure we, we've, we've done retrospective testing to see if the anti-pig antibodies that could potentially be found in, um, uh, you know, pooled uh, samples of IVIG uh, were present and were, could be um, active against the transplant. We, we don't really have a, a definitive answer, but the, the first reason that we gave them was, um, you know, we gave so many immunosuppressing drugs uh, to Mr. Bennett to allow him to accept uh, the xenotransplant that, uh, you know, those drugs have consequences uh, such as makes uh, him a little bit less able to fight off infection. And so as he had kind of bumps in the road, and infection is always something that we think of really in any patient who's critically ill in the ICU, um, you know, we always, uh, sign of infection kind of cast a wide net in terms of our thinking and try to figure out what the infection, if it's present, what it could be, um, and how can we best treat it. And so very, very often we start with a very broad approach to treating the infection because we want to make sure that we um, don't miss the cause. And, you know, sometimes we treat infection even if we're not even 100% sure that that's what it is. But at one point he got a little sick and we thought that an infection was a high likelihood of, of causing what we were observing. So we gave him some antibiotics, um, and, and Dr. Saharia was our infectious disease doctor um, the whole time. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, kind of touched all of our bases. And so we decided to give him some immunoglobulins back because um, as a consequence, expected consequence, and it was something that we had actually intended to do, um, you know, depleted some of the immune cells that create immunoglobulins, and, and that would help protect him from rejecting the heart. Um, but you know the the other side effect. It's always kind of two sides to every every coin. Uh, is that it makes him a little bit um, less able to fight infections. So we gave him those immunoglobulins to kind of replete what what had been depleted because of his um, anti-rejection or uh, immunosuppression treatment. I would say immunosuppression treatment. And then the second time we did it was. Um, uh, actually, uh, these antibodies can actually be used to protect allografts, and so those are human heart transplants um, uh, from uh, concerns of, of rejection. So we did that kind of empirically, again, when we were um, trying to cast a wide net as to what we were observing clinically, um, you know, when we had these ups and downs and some, some clinical declines, um, you know, we were trying to think broadly and, and treat him um, in a way that could, um, again, we say empirically, we, we never really knew exactly what was happening at the time, and very often we don't when a patient um, shows a sign of decline, but we did that to try to prevent um, something that we were thinking about that was going to happen. Um, and then kind of in hindsight, uh, recognized that, um, you know, there was the potential for these 
uh, antibodies that we were giving him, the IVIG, to have uh, the effect of having uh, antibodies to pigs. Uh, we all actually uh, have uh, antibodies uh, to pigs. Uh, we tested Dave Bennett's antibodies and we kind of tracked them along the course. Um, so that was something that we kind of learned along the way and we're still kind of doing tests to see uh, what the significance of uh, giving those I the, the IVIG drugs were. Um, I don't know if Dr. Sahari or Dr. Griffith um, has any more to weigh, weigh in, but that's kind of why we gave them and, and we're still kind of in the process of learning um, what the effect might have been as we are learning many things about uh, uh, his course and exactly what happened. There's still many unknowns and we're doing a deep dive, like Dr. Griffith said, to try to figure that out. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, hi, this is um, Kapil. So, so I don't know that I have much more to add uh, to what um, uh, Dr. Grazzoli just uh, just said. I mean, I, I think, you know, she highlighted kind of the, the main concerns that we had at the time. Um, you know, when we have patients uh, that uh, undergo transplantation, we are always trying to strike that right balance between managing the, the medications that they're on, the anti-rejection medications with risk of infection. Um, and, and um, you know, Dave Sr. was given a, a combination of, of medications to prevent rejection, some of which we had not used before in combination. Um, and, and so we had anticipated, as has already been alluded to, that he would be very weakened, uh, his immune system would be very weakened, and that was out of necessity to prevent, um, you know, there uh, being a rejection episode. But, but it, it seemed that as kind of the weeks had gone on and, and we got to this stage where, um, you know, there was a heightened concern for an infectious process, whatever that may be, um, you know, bacterial, viral, fungal, um, but, but he did not have much of an immune system at that point to fight the infection. Um, and, and, you know, the administration of this immune globulin is something that is done um, fairly routinely when we identify people that have these low levels um, uh, as a means to kind of protect them and help them um, uh, fight infection. Um, and, and, you know, my hope is that, that we will be able to kind of get to this answer as to what the role is that uh, the immunoglobulins played. Um, you know, as Dr. Griffith had alluded to earlier, when it comes to looking at the different biopsies and, and um, you know, looking for evidence of rejection, kind of the, the classic findings that we typically would see if, if there were to be a reaction to the IVIG that was given the immune globulin was not seen. Um, and so again, this is partly why we kind of went through these extra steps of trying to identify um, you know, how much antibodies were there in some of these allotments of the immune globulin. And, and that, you know, I think in terms of the field, um, you know, I think that that is really important, I think, for, for the field to know that, um, you know, this uh, may be something that has to be tested before it's given. So not that it, it, it can never be given to a person who gets a, a xenograft, whether it's a kidney or heart, but that, um, that you may have to test the batches that are given to make sure that the amount of antibodies are not high. Um, uh, for fear of, of precipitating a, a potential rejection episode from the IVIG. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Griffith had to, had to leave the call as he had to go to another hospital. Thank him so much for us. Next time you talk with him. Um, I have some specific questions as you're here, Dr. Saharia. Um, a little bit more, if you could comment about the porcine cyclomegavirus that you guys um, were able to PCR. Um, so, so what I understood is that the, the, the pig was originally was, was screened for CMV, right, nasally, um, and that there was no CMV detected, and, and that you guys were still waiting for the in-situ hybridization results and those kinds of things. Um, but we're wondering if you could speak a little bit about how screening might go forwards in the future um, for, for when you do get permission to, to work with these pigs with another patient perhaps and and how that directs your screening procedures and the production perhaps of those transgenic pigs that you would be using right um for future transplantation so, yeah thank you for that question so so you know i i think that uh, you know, there, there's been so much that has been um 
learned um, from this experience, and and you know I think we all have uh, Dave Junior and, and and Dave Senior obviously to, uh, to to thank for this. And then the the the, the porcine CMV was something that obviously was was rather unexpected. Um, the the donor animals that are used, um, you know, for these types of uh, transplants, um, non-human primate transplants, and in this particular case, um, you know, this the xeno transplant. Um, they they go through a, a battery of testing, um, and, and the, these tests are done fairly routinely um, over the course of, of the, um, the the donor animal's life. So quarterly, they were getting these screening tests done, um, and so for for PCMV in particular, the, the screening involved a nasopharyngeal uh, sample, uh, and and a PCR was done, um, and on multiple tests. Uh, the donor animal had screened negative. And, and this was something that had been well established in the literature as far as um, the uh, proper methodology uh, for, for screening. Um, for other viruses, they may use a blood sample, um, you know, for different parasites that look at stool, but, but for the porcine CMV, it was a naso, nasopharyngeal sample. Um, and, and so we felt pretty good with the repeated test results that, that, um, that, that the source animal uh, was indeed negative. Um, when we detected it eventually, um, you know, and, and initially when we when we saw it, you know, we weren't quite sure what to make of the result, um, and and so it actually took a lot of additional tests to really confirm that 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 this was truly you know porcine CMV because it was um, you know, the implications were actually rather important um, and 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 um, you know for the field in general, and so we wanted to feel confident that what we were detecting. Um, you know, during the course of his um, uh, post-transplant care was, was, was again, true porcine CMV, and, 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 it, and it took a while to actually confirm that. Um, so, so, so what has happened as a result? Um, so Revivacor, which is the company that Dr. Griffith uh, mentioned uh, that provided the uh, source animal, you know, they went back and looked at their screening procedures um, and, and did some additional testing from different samples on the source animal and, and you know, confirmed that yes, indeed, you know, the, the nasopharyngeal sampling um, probably was not accurate. Um, and, and so they have changed their methodology for, for screening, um, which involves uh, using a different sample, uh, but also a, a more um, uh, detailed uh, and, and uh, more sensitive method of uh, PCR screening where it is um, two rounds of, of PCR. So that's what they're doing now is, is what's called a, um, a, a nested PCR. So you can pick up even smaller copies uh, than what was being done initially. Um, and, and so I think that this will be kind of the way forward for the company um, and hopefully will prevent something like this from happening in the future. Introduced 
Dr. So, Allison Grazioli. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Allison Grazioli. Uh, she's the medical director of the cardiac surgery of the intensive care unit. Um, she is affiliated with the University of Maryland, um, and uh, and she's also a member of the UM faculty of physicians. Um, she's done her fellowship at the University Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania for nephrology, and then she's also gone to uh, her fellowship at the University of Maryland Medical Center on critical care in 2017. Uh, her certifications include the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, critical care medicine, uh, nephrology, and internal medicine. And then now I have Bennett's mom here, who is my PhD student. <clears throat> Hello, I would like to introduce Dr. Sandra Bujan Henry today. She's an associate professor at Chaminade University. She teaches the DNP and the BSN program. She also has been working at the Queens Medical Center for more than 27 years. Um, she's also the STEMI coordinator here, and she's my DNP chair, <laughs> so I'm going to be done next week, hopefully. And I'm doing my DNP currently on long COVID, and I guess that she's my chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, so again, I'd like to um, thank David Bennett Jr., and thank you for giving us this opportunity to ask questions in, in this history-making event. We really appreciate it, and for providing us um, to learn from your, your dad's experience. Thank you. Um, I, I asked a couple of physicians and um, our manager here at Queens, um, some of the nurses here, I guess it's two o'clock, well not three in Hawaii, so everybody's busy working, um, doing surgeries, um, but I have a question from Dr. Peter Sai. He's our cardiothoracic surgeon. He really wanted to be here and said if he's not, he's in, in surgeries. I think, I don't think he's online. Um, but he had a question um, that asked, what red tape um, did you have to go through for the emergency authorization to, prefer, to perform the xenotransplantation, for example, the FDA? And could you explain some of the process that you went through um, for the IRB approval and the ethics committee? Uh, um, so this is probably a, a question um, better fielded by Dr. Griffith, who um, kind of led uh, the application, the emergencies uh, uh, application for the FDA. But, um, you know, we were all kind of involved in um, getting hospital approvals. Um, and we got approvals kind of at every level. So um, the uh, initial application Dr. Griffith and the Zeno team uh, put in was uh, specifically um, for Mr. Bennett uh, for uh, the Zeno heart uh, transplant, also one of the medications, uh, the immunosuppressive medications. Um, and one aspect of the surgery uh, that um, was found in the non-human primate uh, uh, research that they did to uh, improve the, sur the survival of the xenograft. So it was kind of a, a perfusion technique um, that they did. So they uh, submitted an application uh, for FDA review and approval of um, those components of the procedure. Um, and again, it was just for one patient, Mr. Bennett, um, and it was uh, kind of an emergency therapeutic application uh, because uh, as Dr. Griffith explained, there, there were no other standard therapeutic options for Mr. Bennett. Um, they uh, submitted it uh, and then, you know, got reviews back and had a number of meetings uh, where the FDA, you know, really reviewed everything with a fine tooth comb and asked them many, many questions. And then they had to, you know, they'd give, get, be gotten a period of time where they have to kind of respond to the questions. It was fairly comprehensive. Um, everything from um, they reviewed the research uh, that kind of warranted, uh, that kind of led them to the the uh, the uh, place where they thought that they could offer this uh, to a patient. Um, they reviewed um, uh, the the model. They reviewed um, even the the surveillance, the infectious surveillance procedures that the company had that we had. Our infection surveillance plan. They reviewed our immunosuppression plan and, and the follow-up plans that 
um, we had in place uh, for Mr. Bennett uh, post-transplant. This was very, very comprehensive. Um, and after a lot of effort on, on Dr. Griffith and the Xeno transplant team's part, um, the, the FDA granted the approval. Um, so that was one specific aspect of the approval. And then again, at every other level, I think that was even, all, many of them were, were mentioned in um, your question. We had a separate um, ethics committee uh, reviewed this, um, approved it. Uh, we had um, that we had the School of Medicine review it. We had the university review it. It was really every level of the institution was involved uh, reviewing um, uh, this plan, uh, and we had to go through multiple meetings and get multiple approvals, kind of, kind of at every level. It was a lot of work. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you. Um, so I have another question from our. Um, I guess she just stepped up, but she's our cardiac invasive and cardiac recovery unit manager. But I mean, generally speaking, when things about organ, um, when thinking about organ transplant, people tend to focus on the physical challenges of the illness itself, and then the transplant procedure and the recovery process. But they may be less likely to consider the psychological challenges and the emotional toll this life-changing surgery can have on patients and their families. So her question is, um, again, it's common for human heart transplant patients and their families to go through emotional trials before, during, and after the transplant process. How is this different for the recipient and his family going through the xenotransplantation? And what was the anticipated plan to assist the patient and the family through this process? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, and it's, it's very easy for us, even as physicians, when we, when we counsel patients to kind of focus on the details of the surgery um, and the things that we're trained to know best. Um, but then there's this whole other um, uh, layer of, of, of emotions and, and things that patients will have to deal with with, with a normal human heart transplant. Um, it's kind of resetting their life and creating a whole new normal um, because uh, a lot of things come with a, a transplant. Um, and with the Xeno transplant, I think Dave Jr. kind of alluded to some other layers that, you know, again, this was uncharted territory for, for all of us. I don't think we knew, or ex knew what to expect in terms of um, how much attention and um, all of the the spotlight that was going to be on the institution, uh, you know, Mr. Bennett and, and, and Dave Jr. And, and his family. So um, I would say that this was kind of uncharted waters for all of us. Um, there were a lot of uh, great moments. Uh, I remember uh, when uh, the heart transplant happened. Um, uh, we, we put the news on, we, the, the news uh, of his transplant came out a couple of days later, he was extubated. And we put the news on for, for him to watch it and, and the ICU kind of stood in the background as the news came on with Dave, uh, the patient, with the news on, you know, kind of uh, talking about the historic transplant. And I think the greatest, uh, Thing that we got out of it was really getting to know um, Dave Bennett, Dave Bennett Jr. and his family. Um, that was such a gift for us. And I think that um, all of those unexpected things and all of the hurdles that we had to overcome, um, it was made so much easier because we, we got, we, we developed such strong relationships with just a wonderful group of people and got to know them in a way that is really, really unique and special, and we're really very grateful. Yeah, thank you. I did. I did saw a short video clip um, of, of David. Um, I guess he was having physical therapy, and they said he really liked football, and so he was able to watch a football game with the physical therapist. Although he couldn't stand because of the months of lying in bed, but he was able to sit up and watch that game, and, and that was really touching. Um, I'm sure it's touching for the whole staff um, at your medical center. Um, so I have a question from our um, our nurses in the cardiac recovery area, um, Paula Hyde and Marie Baisa. And they said, how did you prepare the staff nurses and the cardiovascular open heart unit to 
care for a xeno transplant recipient. Is the immunosuppressive drug therapy different from, from a regular transplant or human transplant patient? Um, and was the recovery uh, expected to be shorter or longer for the xeno transplant recipient? Um, so we prepared uh, the staff um, and, and Dr. Saharia can, can talk to talk about this as well because we did it um, you know, with different aspects of the care in, in mind. Um, one, how do you care for, from, from the cardiothoracic ICU where, where I work, we prepared our nurses and our providers and our physicians and our pharmacists uh, to care for um, a xenotransplant. And, you know, the foundation was, it's going to be very similar to the care of a typical um, human heart transplant. Uh, with some differences and with some, you know, more potential, you know, unanticipated events happening. Um, so we described things that we could anticipate from the non-human primate models, such as I think Dr. Griffith mentioned that there was a possibility that this heart would have some more um, funny heart rhythms, we call them arrhythmias. It didn't end up happening. But we were prepared for that. And because of that possibility, we kind of tried to stay away from certain medications that we give to your typical human heart transplant to kind of help enhance its squeeze right after surgery. It can kind of get a little stunned and a little swollen. We stayed away from those medications because we were nervous that the, the porcine or the, the xenotransplant was going to have a higher risk of these arrhythmias, which those normal uh, medications for standard heart transplant can kind of provoke. So there were little things that we deviated from, and we were very we were very um, diligent to communicate those with the staff so that they recognize when we're deviating from the typical way we approach a human heart transplant. We had several meetings with all levels of the team to kind of talk about the medication and the uh, the care aspects, and then we had other meetings with the, with different members of the team, and we had multiple different meetings so we could target the different groups to kind of uh, go over, you know, safety, uh, um, uh, you know, discuss the sensitive nature of uh, the xenotransplant and how to handle people who might be asking questions and also infection surveillance and prevention and how to make sure that everybody, um, the patient, the staff, and anybody who could come in contact with the equipment could be safe just because there were just so many unknowns uh, that occurred with, you know, the surgery because it had just never happened before. I don't know if Dr. Zaharia wants to comment a little further because he was instrumental in kind of helping us prepare um, all of the staff uh, to make sure that this was successful and safe. Sure. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I was um, involved uh, in trying to educate the the ICU staff, but but also um, many other uh, providers and and um, and hospital staff, uh, you know, for this. Uh, you know, groundbreaking uh, xenotransplant. And, and, and again, you know, everything that had been done before um, had been in a very controlled setting. Um, and so you're taking uh, a procedure that um, there is a fair amount of experience with in a controlled setting in non-human primates and now moving it into clinical care. Um, and so um, there is, you know, I think in, in a, a, a reasonable amount of literature that made us feel fairly safe about doing this um, in the clinical setting. But again, having never done this, you don't know what to expect. And I think that part of our approach was to kind of be prepared. Um, you know, I went through Boy Scouts and, and, and was an Eagle Scout, so that's the motto, right? Be prepared. Um, so, so, so be prepared for anything. Um, and, and so we took a very, very conservative approach when it came to the infection control practices. Um, and which you know some people may have found onerous, but but I think you know were, were necessary, um, and and so you know we made sure that um, that uh, you know Mr. Bennett was in his own room. We made sure he had a one-to-one -one nurse, um, you know, for labs that could be done as point of care as opposed to sending every lab down to the main lab. We would try to do some labs that could be done as point of care labs. Um, rather than tube everything through our hospital tube system, we actually walked a lot of his labs down just for that added layer of protection. Um, uh, instruments that were used, we tried to um, uh, uh, kind of set aside um, so they weren't being used on other patients. Um, and and uh, 
So, so there were a lot of those types of things that, that we had to have discussions about and had to prepare for. Um, you know, with this being done during the midst of the COVID pandemic, a lot of our infection control practices for the COVID pandemic were actually well suited for, um, you know, for this uh, type of um, procedure because everyone was already used to wearing gowns. Everyone was already used to wearing masks. Everyone was already used to wearing gloves going into patient rooms. So that made it a little bit easier. Um, so, so, so there was you know, a lot of discussion um, surrounding that. Um, and, and, and those would certainly be things that might be a little bit different than our approach to a, a normal human heart transplant recipient where we don't have that one-to-one -one nursing and, and labs are usually sent uh, through kind of routine um, uh, methods. And um, we kept track of, of providers that were um, uh, taking care of him. Um, and uh, so, so, so there were you know, these, I, I wouldn't say that these were major changes. I think that these were uh, kind of educating, reinforcing, and, and really just making sure that, that the staff members really were comfortable um, with this um, because uh, by and large, the data that had been collected over the last 20 to 25 years really um, you know, demonstrated that this really should be a, a safe procedure from an infection control standpoint, not to mention the you know, uh, experiences of, of farm workers and average farm workers um, and, and, and the really kind of the, the lack of, of um, kind of pathogen transmission um, you know, in, in, in those settings uh, where there is more intimacy um, with, with the animals. Thank you. I, I know um, you probably have answered this question part of the way, but um, to successfully execute the first four scenes, you know, transplantation, many players were involved. You know, part of your team included the surgeons, the cardiologists, anesthesiologists, psychiatrists, infectious disease, infection prevention, the critical care unit, and the ethics committee, and many, many more. So how did you coordinate this interdisciplinary collaboration to carry out this historical feat? And who was the lead? And what were your barriers? And what was your timeline to kind of get this all together? Um, so yes, you're correct. There were many, many, many people involved from many, many disciplines. Um, the leaders were uh, Dr. Griffith and Dr. Mahina, um, the scientists who know this today. Um, the scientists uh, and Dr. Griffith, uh, and, and Dr. Griffith, um, you know, they did a lot of the non-human primate work that kind of pioneered uh, the the information that kind of led us to have the possibility of having the xenotransplant. transplant. So they were always in the lead. Um, uh, Mr. Bennett had been in our ICU uh, for several weeks before he got um, his xenotransplant. So, um, you know, we have a, a typical workflow whereby which consultants, uh, you know, such as the cardiologists, infectious disease consultants, psychiatrists kind of communicate. So it was kind of like that, but just a little bit more, uh, uh, more people than, than are typically involved. Um, you know, just because his case was just so complicated and so novel, and we were really interested in having, you know, all of the expert opinions that we could have. Um, so, you know, we had, I would say we would run at least twice a day. We were always in contact, um, but, you know, everybody would kind of be at the bedside in the morning for rounds, um, you know, weekends, holiday, I don't know if there's holiday, but, but every single day, most often twice a day. Um, and then, you know, we have, you know, our, our, our apps that are, have patient secured group messaging. We would have a constant stream of messages just for updates and ideas and thoughts just to keep everybody in the loop. It was just a lot of communication, kind of just using all the tools. And then we went back to basics. We just did our, you know, our rounds outside the patient's room, like, you know, doctors have been doing for decades um, with everybody there, where everybody had a chance to kind of weigh in, um, nursing, pharmacy, uh, cardiology, infectious disease, Dr. Griffith, the scientific team would come by from the lab to, you know, give us their input. Because a lot of what we were doing, you know, clinically, we were basing on what we learned from the non-human primate animal studies. And so it was, it was truly a multidisciplinary effort from the people at the bench to the people who were taking care of the, the patient at the bedside. Um, so it just took a lot of hard work and, and a lot of constant communication. 
Thank you. So we're really stressing with this new generation of students, you know, how healthcare is interdisciplinary. So this is a great example of what you folks did. So my last question, a little long-winded, um, is xenotransplantation can lead to dramatic advances in medicine and population health. So over the years, many discoveries have been made, such as genetically modifying the gene of a donor animal to prevent rejection. So as Dr. Griffith had mentioned, you know, identifying the gal, gal alpha one Greek galactose sugar as the main target of the anti-pig antibody in humans help prevent that hyperacute re rejection. And then adding human transgenes help to inhibit blood clotting and reduce inflammation. So in the porcine to human transplant in Maryland, you mentioned that 10 genes were altered and the, the edits knocked out three um, key sugars, added two human transgenes and that to inhibit the blood clotting and four other, uh, others to reduce inflammation. And then you also preserved the heart before surgery in the, I don't know if it's called ex vivo, mm -hmm. um, was another discovery that contributed to successful xenotransplantation, um, providing hypothermic non-ischemic perfusion to keep the organ healthy until you folks were ready. And so porcine endogenous retrovirus PERS still pose a threat to the xenotransplantation recipient and you folks discussed that nicely. Um, so still researchers are discovering ways to decrease the dangers of PERS. So um, at the end, what were the most significant breakthroughs you learned? And what was the biggest obstacles? You know, what insights did you learn? And what are your next steps? Um, that's a great question. I would say we're still learning, um, and, and some of, you know, the, the, the biggest questions as to what happened in the end, we, we don't have the answer for just yet because we are still doing very, very, um, detailed studies with a lot of collaborators, um, that are trying to kind of uncover those answers. Um, but you're, you're right. A lot of, um, advancements led to this. Um, you know, that there were 10 gene modifications for the, for the pig one, you know, to reduce, uh, uh, you know, uh, human, uh, you know, uh, immunogenicity against the pig, but also other things like you said, blood clotting, and then Dr. Griffin had mentioned the growth hormone uh, receptor was knocked out to try to get the size to, to match uh, correctly. But even, even with all of those, um, you know, all of that research that led up to that, you saw that we learned that, you know, what we had expected wasn't exactly necessarily uh, what turned out because Dr. Griffith had mentioned that the size of the heart was not quite what he had expected. So that just brought up other questions for us. So in the future, if we were to do this again, how do we size the heart? How do we know um, if what to expect when we choose, uh, you know, this pig was chosen because of its weight um, and you know the heart in this pig was supporting a, an animal that was that weighed more than than you know the re recipient, um, but it just still wasn't the size that we expected. So we learned something there. Um, we um, used the ex vivo machine, like you said, which uh, what that is is um, when the heart is explanted from the pig, they place it on a machine that would recirculate uh, blood with this specific perfusate, which was also kind of a scientific advancement that was developed um, with numerous uh, researchers in the field that kind of um, helped the heart kind of, um, uh, once it was taken out of the pig, kind of uh, kept it very well protected, I guess is the best way to put it, so that it gave it an additional uh, time to be perfused, uh, allowing it to be protected so that, you know, when it's removed from the host animal and placed into the pig, it had the, the best chance of kind of taking hold well and then having uh, survival kind of over a longer period of time. So both that machine and the perfusate were another scientific advancement. Um, and then the uh, immunotherapies that we gave um, Mr. Bennett uh, were the result of decades of research. Uh, and even with that, we had to learn how to monitor levels. Um, we had to see if he had any side effects to it. There was a whole world of uh, monitoring that we did really kind of with every single aspect uh, of uh, the, the procedure, the medications. Um, we monitored 
everything from levels to his response. We learned so much, uh, you know, literally every step of the way. And I don't even think I could pinpoint on one big thing that we learned because we just learned so much. Um, literally every thing that we did, we just weren't 100% were sure what the outcome would be. And now we know. And so we kind of have Mr. Bennett kind of as our map. Uh, and all of this, this information that he gave us that we will refer back to forever um, whenever we do uh, another Xeno transplant. Um, he's kind of set the foundation. And um, as I mentioned, there's so many ongoing studies, uh, you know, with samples that we have and with the data that we have that we're going to continue to learn um, even more. Um, uh, and then, and you did mention um, the porcine uh, endogenous retrovirus. Um, that kind of gets into the uh, infection realm. Um, I'll kind of let Capel speak to that because uh, I think we learned uh, quite a bit, which we alluded to uh, throughout the conversation. Uh, in that realm too, the, the porcine infections. Um, I'll let him kind of speak to that. Yes, thank you. So, so uh, I think we, we spoke a little bit about kind of the the, the uh, porcine CMV and and some of the um, uh, adjustments that are now being made to the screening practices of, of the donor animals. I mean, I think that that's actually a, a huge um, uh, advance um, and and. and it, you know, I think it's not just with porcine CMV, but you know, probably making sure that that the surveillance that's being done for the uh, for the donor animals uh, is as precise as we need it to be. Um, so, so I think that that's really something that has come out of this. Uh, you know, understanding you know what are the best practices you know for infection control. Um, you know, having never done something like this in the clinical setting, one of the questions is, you know, are there risks for healthcare workers? Are there going to be risks for family members? Um, and, and so that's something that we're also going to be taking a look at as um, as kind of the weeks go on, which is, you know, if we are screening some of our healthcare workers, you know, will we find any evidence of, of her? Will we find any evidence of this porcine CMB? So, so these are all lessons that uh, are to be gained from this that I think will uh, advance our field um, and uh, you know certainly uh, make it easier the, the next time uh, we go through something like this and and we have uh, you know David Bennett senior and, and we have David Jr and his family to thank for uh, where we are now. Um, thank you as I just like to thank you all you know for giving us that showing up um, University, <clears throat> sorry, at Shamanan University and Queens Medical Center, this opportunity to learn from you folks and hope we can continue this relationship. And I definitely want to say thank you uh, to David Bennett Jr. and his family, you know, our condolences to you, but thank you so much for sharing this experience. And I, you know, I teach my students that one day, I mean, you're all going to have patients that have a xenotransplant. You know, we've been doing um, porcine aortic valve transplants for over 20 years here at Queens and in our trans aortic valve replacements. I mean, it's just part of you know our practice to do this. So, so um, what you folks are doing is groundbreaking. I just want to thank you. And I know Dr. Uh, our Dr. Griffith from um, Chaminade University. I thought, is there any relationship? He has the same last no. name, but she liked to do some closing statements. But thank you again. to impact the future. Um, and so I just wanted to ask 
you guys really have you on the line, where do you foresee this xenotransplantation effort taking us in the next 50 years or a century or so that you can share? Um, I awesome. think, oh, okay, do you wanna? No, 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 go for it, go for it. Um, well, I mean, I think that um, this was in many regards a very big success. Uh, we learned um, so much uh, from Mr. Bennett uh, and will continue to do so. Um, and it is um, everybody's greatest hope that uh, xenotransplant will continue to um, occur and uh, be even more successful in the future. You know, there's talk of, um, you know, clinical trials. Uh, where we can, in a, rig in a rigorous way, uh, do xenotransplant at some point in the future um, and really, really um, get to define who should get these transplants, how to optimize them, and how to get, to get them to um, save the most lives. Um, and having had Mr. Bennett go through the xenotransplant process has just kind of energized uh, the, the scientific community around xenotransplantation um, and the number of collaborations, the number of conferences, the number of things that are being written about uh, xenotransplantation is just exponential, that I think it's just going to kind of skyrocket uh, xenotransplant, you know, going forward. And I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about it um, in the weeks, months, years to come for sure. Yeah, no, I would, I would concur. I mean, I think it's hard to predict, you know, what, you know, something like this will look like in 50 years or 100 years. I mean, I think that that's all <laughs> quite a bit uh, of time away, and, and uh, you know, many advances can happen between now and then. Um, but, but I think you know, the, this field of xenotransplant has, you know, taken root from really the, the 1960s, um, and. and you know, we're talking about 50 plus years where, you know, since the very first attempt at a xenotransplant was, uh, was made. Um, and, and even, you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, everything was really being done in the lab. Um, and, and so I think, um, as Dr. Grazioli has already alluded to, you know, this really, I think, is, is um, kind of setting, setting for um, really bigger steps. Um, and, and clinical trials are being discussed, um, uh, you know, for kidneys, uh, probably as a first step. Uh, I know that there are, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in potentially doing another uh, Xeno heart. Um, and, and I think we want to build on um, Dave Senior's legacy here and, and, and be able to uh, continue to move this forward um, to the point where uh, we are able to get the next patient out of the hospital, get the next patient home. And I, you know, I think that the goal is to really be able to do that because, you know, as you know, one of your um, uh, you know, colleagues had mentioned during the introduction, there, there is an organ shortage and then we're going to have an organ shortage. And so we have to come up with ways to try to address this issue. Um, and, and so right now, this seems to be the way to do it. Maybe in, in 20, 30 years, we will have a completely different solution, but um, right now, this seems like it, it is one of the opportunities to try to help people who just are unfortunately not able to um, keep going on the wait list. They run out of time. Um, so, so I think that, um, you know, we will hopefully be able to move this forward um, with, uh, you know, Dave's legacy. never imagined that it would happen in mine. So I'm very humbled to be here with all of you today and I really appreciate everyone's time. So um, I think that will wrap it up. If there are any questions, you guys can feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll leave it open for a little while and then I'll forward them and maybe we'll be able to get them to answers later. But I know we're already a half hour over time now. So I'm gonna wrap it up. Unless you guys have any final closing comments. I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I'm thankful for all that participated, listened in. Um, for the team, both at uh, your university as well as the University of Maryland. Um, I think uh, we're doing good by my dad. And uh, as was mentioned, my dad was a fighter and 
uh, he not only fought for himself, but so many others. And uh, I'm not, nothing but optimistic for the future. Uh, and, and I love everybody else's enthusiasm and questions. And I think we only can, you know, move forward from here. So thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.